Good day, everybody. Coming at you live from the internet. This is Kenny Jang, and I've got the one and only Seth Muse on the line. Welcome, Seth, to the show. What? Thanks, Kit. On the line. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me on, man. Again. It uh, is the, uh, the direct interwebs from Texas to New Jersey. We've got um, some really good uh, content to share today. Seth, what I want to do today is uh, introduce you as a church communicator and just share a little bit about your background and what you're doing and your role in the church that you're at in Texas today. So why don't we just start there? Where, tell us a 60-second scoop on um, your trajectory. How did you get to the heights where you are today? Sure. Um, I, I started youth ministry about 18 years ago, and I just kind of worked in small church, like 100 or less, 150 or 200, and then went to some big churches and then back to some small churches. And I've been to Colorado, mostly in Texas. Um, I've worked at a few mega churches, things like that. So I've kind of been all over the place doing youth ministry and youth worship ministry. And this last year, I kind of jumped out of that, trying to make a break and com- and jump into communications, which has become my passion for the past few years. So um Working in a in, the, in a you know a secular job, um, I had had been doing some marketing and things like that, learning, growing, and developing right. network friends and things like that in this uh, in some of our Facebook groups. And so the heights came along. We decided we finally could go to church where we wanted, not where I had to be on staff. And so I wanted to volunteer. I connected with our communications guy. His name's Sean. And said, "Hey, I'd love to volunteer." And he goes, "Hey, we'd love to hire you." <laughs> and I said, "Oh, okay. Um, that's crazy. You didn't think about that." So we talked a few months, and then I ended up uh, leaving my secular job that I'd only been at for nine to ten months, and jumped back into the church world. And so now I'm the social media and web developer associate at uh, the Heights in Richardson, Texas. Wow. So two things. Um, c- can you give us just one piece of contrast uh, between your job as a youth pastor? And communications, because I always thought that, you know, getting through to the youth, getting through to the generation below you all the time, you need to be savvy and understanding. And communication is key, right? If you want to be successful. So absolutely. There, what's one contrast or what's one similarity that you're drawing from those two roles? Well, I would say that one of the contrasts is that I get to, I get to, be home at night, mm-hmm. and whereas youth pastors, we're we work pretty much from noon till midnight and, and even later, you know, and so now I get to, I work at eight thirty, and I work till six or so five or six and yeah. then I'm done. And, and so that's, that's a nice change. As I get older, I kind of have a little less patience for being out and about, you know, <laughs> I'm just, you know, I just want to be home. And so I can do social media if I need to for the church from home. So I have a, I'm a lot more flexible, a lot more mobile. Um, and my, my, the thing that is similar is that youth, you have to have these social channels to connect with them during the day because they're in school. And with separation of church and state, especially in some areas, it's like lockdown for youth pastors. It's just hard to get in there. Um, and if you do go in, you can only do a certain few things. So it's nice to have that connection, that inroad. And it's a good training ground for anybody that wants to be a communications director right, because right. you have to learn all that. Yeah, you, it's a must, right? It's a must. Now, it what is. about a secular uh, communications role? Like, like yourself, I was in the marketplace for a while. Um, what is something that you think is um, tr- a key transferable skill set mm-hmm. or activity that you're finding? Man, I... I think there is an incredible amount of information that you can train yourself. And one of the things in the marketing world is it's actually moving faster than the church communications world. And so keeping up is a daily endeavor. And I think there's ways that you can find uh, sites and people that you follow and, and using social media to actually teach yourself how to do new things and creative things that help you do your job better. And I think that in the church world, we're a little slower with that. And I I think we're faster now than ever before, but we still tend to be a little behind on some of these trends because some of us kind of get in a role and we, we just kind of stick to it, you know, and, and and that's easy to do in marketing as well. I mean, you could easily get in that situation as well, but for me being in a place where I really didn't know what I was doing, (laughs) I had, I had to figure it out, man. And that's a daily, like, okay, here's the challenge for today. How am I going to beat it? And, you know, sometimes in the church world, we kind of get in a, a, a we get in that mode, too, where we go, OK, I got to reach my people. How am I going to do that? So there's some similarities, some differences. But mostly in the marketing world, there's just different bottom lines. 
You know, there's a bottom line in the marketing world for product and then the bottom line for people in church. I think that's how do you like the difference? One difference I found that is a big contrast is the seven day production cycle, right? The Mm. church, you're on a machine, a treadmill that goes, your target is the next seven days. You got to deliver and then it starts over and over again, right? Or it might be um, every couple of weeks because there might be a sermon series cycle, some promotional cycle. Um, how, how do you like that? Or, you know, what, what do you feel about that versus the marketplace jobs? I, I like that because it, it, it limits it appropriately, but also keeps it moving so that you're always doing something. And in the marketing world, you can work on something for a while and then launch it and it might fail. You know, in the church world, you have a week, you launch it, it fails, fine. You do it again, different next week. You know, it's like quick, 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 you can, you can turn it over. And so that's kind of nice. But in the church world, I feel like there's a uh, there's that you get in a rhythm a little easier and you can develop some habits and they can be bad, but they could be good habits, too. And I like that cycle. I, I missed it when I was out. It felt like I would sit sometimes and not know what I was supposed to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. whereas in the church world, there's never a question. <laughs> it's just sit down and you're all about your people and you and if you've been a pastor for a while, like I have, it's like that comes naturally now to think about. How can I reach people? I'm just doing it different through social yep. or web. So that helps a lot. For sure, for sure. Well, so today what we're going to do is we're tackling our Lunch and Learn series. This is one of the reasons why I was really uh, anticipating this um, session with you today, Seth, is because I think you are uh, full of creative ideas and real-life application of those things. Every time I talk to you, um, it's it's really an inspiration. So in part Thanks. of our Lunch and Learn, I'd love for you to share with us a little bit. I think you've prepared for us um, a little framework of how to approach the different social networks. And so why don't we go yeah. into that at this point? Sure. Um, as a as a pastor and a leader, you know, you have your heroes, and Andy Stanley is one of mine. So one of his kind of truths or principles or whatever that I was attached to was he he has one sentence job descriptions for all of his people. Yeah. That was incredibly helpful. I did that for my youth leaders, my, my volunteers. I created a one sentence job description for them. That was always really helpful for me in my ministry. So I came to this social media ministry that I now head up and, and kind of approached it the same way. And I developed a one word vision statement, I guess, for each platform of what I basically want to accomplish. And so that has given me a lot of focus in what I'm trying to do. And there's still a lot of cross posting and things like that. Cause as a church, you know, you, you can get away with that a little bit, but, um, for the most part, it helps me to focus on what I'm trying to accomplish with each, each one of those platforms. Yeah. Well, before we even go into that, you picked up on something that I think a lot of, um, I find people who are new to the role of communications or new to adopting social media, their knee-jerk reaction is to think that everything is the same. You obviously don't think that is the case. Right. Can you speak to a little bit about that, the dynamics of um, different voices or personas for each of the, the the channels and why you're doing this? Yeah, and I think it's a nuanced thing. It's where you can put out some of the same content, but the way you put it out is different. And how you it's more about how you kind of act in the moment of the social media. It's the social part of it that changes. I think the media part might be the same. Like I'm going to take a video of my pastor's sermon. I'm going to put it on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Why? Because that kind of content does well each one of those places. Right. But, but for Facebook, I'm going to put out a little bit longer heading. I'm going to put up some, you know, and I'm not going to put any hashtags in it for Twitter. I'm going to hashtag the heck out of that thing, you know, so people will see it and find our church And there's a reason for that. Uh, On Instagram, I'm going to use some hashtags too, but I'm really going to focus more on telling a story about what was going on in this um, in this clip. So it's just a little bit different how each one of them gets put out. And I don't always do that, but when I do have content that works really well on all those platforms, then I try to find ways to make it specific to that platform because of my one word vision. So you're not a proponent of those plugins that automatically copy and paste across all of the networks and duplicates the content. Not really. I do use uh, I do use Buffer, but what I'll do is I'll create one and I'll select all the ones I want it to go to, put it in the queue, and then I'll go through and kind of edit and make them look appropriate if I'm going to cross post. Love that. So, Love that. So it's a little extra work, but I think it, it makes it neater and more you know customized for that platform, works a little better. There's those that say you upload to Facebook, and I've done some run- tests on my own. 
I don't see a lot of difference. I know there is some, and uh, but I just kind of like, you know what? I ain't got time for that. So I'm just going to throw it in buffer. And, you know, I'm managing other things too. I'm building a website for our church right now. I don't have time to post everything native. I just don't have time for it. So. Right, right. And speaking of automation, is buffer the only tool that you are using for publishing at this point? I use later as well. Um, I, I do use Hootsuite. I used to use Hootsuite and I like Hootsuite. I just like how Buffer works better. Um, it has the content inbox and it has the Pablo with the graphic design and, and I really use Canva or Spark for graphics. So I really don't gotcha. even use Pablo, but yeah, it's just, it's easier to see it. It's easier to, to work and, and see where everything's, are, everything's going. I just, it works better for my brain. I right. like it better. So you're not automating the actual posting to Instagram at this point. No, that's, that's the hard, I mean, no, nobody does that. I mean, Grum can do it, and I don't even know if that's legal. <laughs> I think they're they've got a workaround, but that that's the only one I've found that does it. Yeah, Gr- I mean, I saw I, I use Grum, and we use Grum for yep. our clients. Uh, we um, had clarification from the founder of Grum, okay. and one of the, and he did a big, uh, I think it was an AMA that he did with, on Reddit, and yeah. the, his response was that they are not utilizing the API, so they're not violating the TOS. Oh, okay. And they're using some of the so, technology. He said that it's akin to if I hired you or somebody else to literally sit in front of a computer and upload and do whatever you're automating. Um, if that is not a violation, outsourcing to another human being, then that literally is what they're doing. And so I don't okay. know their technology behind it, um, whether it's, I, honestly, I don't know how they're doing it, um, yeah. but that is, it was a clarification that they're not using the API, they're not using some back end. Well, that's how they're automated. getting around it then. I mean, that's great. That's great. They found a way to do it. They're yeah. the only ones have found out a way to do that. But I like later. Later just reminds me, it sends me, you know, it's, I, it's in, I can't do video because I just, I do the free one. Right. So if I have an upload of a video to Instagram, I just do that native. But Instagram is one of those things where you kind of want to be in the moment anyway. So yes. I'd rather do that really for my phone. And if I've only got to really do manually Instagram, I mean, that's not hard. I mean, I, I can do that, especially for what we've got going on. I just have to be at everything. That's the problem. So <laughs> I have to find some people to be at stuff for me that can take over our Instagram sometimes. Nice. That would nice. be nice. Okay. So let's get to your one word vision statements for each of these platforms. Okay. Uh, our number one platform, hands down, like most people, is Facebook. Uh, Facebook is a great platform. The only issue with Facebook is that it can't, you can't just like watch your wall. Uh, you have to wait for people to, uh, like, or post on your wall or or comment on your stuff. So the number one word is engage. Mm. My word for is engagement. I'm going to comment. I'm going to like, I'm going to respond. When I first came in, our, our response tag, the little check mark by it, it, we weren't verified because our response time was like 10 days. (laughs) <laughs> and so uh, I was like, okay, that's changing. And now we're three minutes. I have a three minute response time. So, because it comes to my phone, I can watch that and I'm checking that every, all day long pretty much. But that's one of those things that people, people start to notice that you're talking to them, that you're, when we say, hey, how can we pray for you? And they type out a prayer request. Well, I'm going to type out a prayer. And, you know, that's, a, that's something they see that and they go, okay, this is a, this isn't just a big machine an organization. This is a person yeah. who cares about me back There's there. There's a person that, behind the account. Exactly. And so it makes it social. It makes it personable. So our big focus for Facebook is engagement. I want to put out posts that are kind of, it's kind of like fishing. You throw the right lure out there, you know, that, that are engaging posts and then you kind of wiggle it around, wait for them to, and then you, and then you can reel them in and you can talk to them. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of how I, I look at Facebook. Um, we post about two, maybe three times a day. Um, are you the only one that's responding to comments for your page? Pretty much. Yeah. And we have about 2000 people in our church. And I know that just saying that can seem like, wow, you must be super busy. Really not. I mean, the way Facebook does their, their fan pages, it's, it's pretty manageable. So I'd like to see it go up. I'd like to get to the point where I can't handle it. But right now I'm part time at the church and I can do it just fine. And so, so. Our, let's go really granular there. In terms of the engagement, so are you liking every comment that someone drops? Are you responding to 100% of comments that are dropped? As much as I can. I don't just respond with like, hey, that's cool. Thanks. You know, it, I try to say something of substance. I'm also liking and commenting on um, reviews. When when people review our church, I say, thanks. We love that you're here. Yes. Um, you know, thanks for coming and visiting us because it, it notifies me when that happens and 
does I mean people not everybody's going to review your church you know when they take the time to do that and it's positive I mean that hardly ever happens most people want to review stuff when they hate it you know and and we've had a guy that that just wouldn't stop bashing the church and I did the standard I'm sorry you felt that way we would love to I'd love to talk to you can you PM me for uh, and let's try to get this worked out and he never would PM me so I ended up having to, I reached out several times and finally just said you know what I'm just going to ban the guy because he wouldn't stop right so I banned him you know, but it's social and I left it out there. It's still out there, you know, so people can see how we handle that. And because I want to see us in, I want them to see us engaging and not just putting out info and putting out announcements and crunching out stuff that we're doing. Yeah, I, this, I this, love this. it. I love it. And when you're, I just want you to rewind and zero in and explain to everybody what you, what you just described is a best case scenario or best mm-hmm. practice actually in yeah. how to handle objections and hecklers, et cetera. So you don't actually engage in a, um, a back and forth debate war on Facebook if someone is a de- no. detractor. No, no, no. I, I'll, I'll reach out the first time and say, I'm sorry you felt that way or that happened. Let's talk privately and I'd love to help you figure this out. And if they come back and, and comment again publicly, I'll reach out one more time and say, uh, again, I'm really sorry that happened, but I would really like to move this conversation to a place where we can actually help you instead of just going back and forth right. on the page. So the objective is to get the conversation offline directly in person. With people, in person, pixels to people. You know, the, any way Love I can that. move them to, from, from online to in person. I had uh, something somebody called the church on the other day, and, you know, I'm, I, I'm in the process of trying to reach out to this person. I'm like, hey, I'd like to have coffee with you. You know, there's there's... Uh, something about getting in front of people or, and realizing, hey, we're humans. It's not you talking to a machine, yeah. feeling like you can just kind of do whatever, you know, and say whatever you want. And I'm not going to feel that way towards you. So it's restoring a little humanity to the social media world. I think we need that really bad right now. So in a church situation, when you have that negative impact, it's you have to respond and you have to do it well. But you also have to go, here's where I'm cutting this off. I love, be, um, the, I love, yeah, your number one objective with hecklers is to move them from pixels to people. Just love mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah, engagement. So I love that Facebook, you're really trying to maximize what Facebook is really set up to do. Um, right. Right. And so uh, engagement is that number one goal. Great. What's the next platform that you've got your head wrapped around? Our, our second biggest is Instagram. Um, when I came on staff in November, at the end of November, right after Thanksgiving, um, then our, the last time we'd posted to our Instagram account was April. That was a good six or so months there that it hasn't posted anything. And so for that one, I started thinking, how is Instagram used? Instagram is about photography. Instagram is about even now with stories like behind the scenes and what's going on live and in the moment. So our word for Instagram is reveal. Um, when I think about Instagram, I'm thinking about revealing what is happening in the moment. I'm revealing... Uh, God's beauty in the world by telling stories and I by you know, sharing some of our, we have a, web, a website called gospelrisk.org. People can type out stories that they've actually shared the gospel. And so I'll share some of those stories on there. Um, here's a volunteer that's doing great this morning. Last week I, I took, a, I was trying to get our connections director, uh, Kim, to shoot a quick video about our first steps class or whatever. And she said, hang on, I got to text this girl. She showed up at the church last week and I invited her. I'm going to make sure she's going to (laughs) come. I'm like, that's great. So while she's texting, I snapped a photo of her. Perfect. And then, and then went back later and put that photo up and said, Hey, here's Kim. Here's what she did. How are you living on mission? You know, and like told that story. It's revealing the vision. It's revealing the stories. It's revealing what our church is about. And what it's like to be here, what it's like to be one of us. And so reveal is the one word description. And it also goes into like behind the scenes. I'm revealing how we work and revealing here's something ridiculous that happened backstage, you know, in our stories feed. So I tend to kind of use like one or two posts a day for Instagram in the main feed. And then if something's going on, I'll use stories to post like a bunch of stuff real fast. But if there's nothing going on, I don't, I don't post the stories. I mean, I don't just post cause I, need to post right so you're not one of those accounts that always has some story live going up there no no i don't i don't see that and and our people don't engage with it i mean they'll watch it but um i really only want to put the good stuff up and and i i think we have a lot of good stuff and when i take one photo and go oh man i need to take this other photo 
I might do that. And then I was like, oh man, look at this. I'm, now I'm going to stories. Boom, 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 story, story, story. Fantastic. So it's my overflow and it's showing behind the scenes. It's where I can let people go, okay, here's the main things going on, but here's the rest of it over here if you want to go check it out. And it's a little more fun because you can draw on it and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more youth oriented or younger generation and they love it. But we just, I don't, I don't want to overflow their, their feed. You know, I want to reveal, but I don't want to kill them with it. Yeah. You know? uh, so, to me, that's um, so super that you are, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maintain that trust in the conversation, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and part of that is revealing specific things. I don't need to reveal what I'm eating right now. <laughs> you know, I need to reveal what our church is doing. If we're having a meeting and there's food, I'll Instagram that. Here is what we're doing. Here we're eating food. It's from this great Mexican food restaurant. But what we're talking about is our R3 groups. And we can't wait to share with you what we're talking about. So it, it's it's always about something that's kind of on mission at, at the same time. It's not just pointless, random stuff. <laughs> now, do you, you know? personally, do you have a Finsta account yourself? Do I have a what? Finsta. Have you heard of the, the, the trend no. of everyone having a Finsta, a fake Instagram account? No, 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 I don't. I this have not is a, heard of that. what the kids are doing these days. And I think it's actually, actually, I find it having some use and I'm using it in my coaching, but basically it's a second account where you can put the non-polished stuff that your friends know, um, that the parents don't actually know about. Oh, right. It's like, but what, what other people are using Finsta is where it's, it's the stuff that you're just you always have that urge to take a picture of that meal or take a picture of this stuff that you know that really shouldn't be cluttering your social feed. So yeah. in order to satiate that impulse, I'm coaching people, set up a Finsta, put all that junk on another feed where it's just, that's what it's dedicated for and call it out for that. Um, yeah, <laughs> satisfy that bad. crave, get it out there, um, but keep your main <laughs> feed uncluttered. Yeah, I think that's important. And, and what we also don't do for Instagram is we don't go for a design brand necessarily. I, I know there's a lot of church accounts that do like you look through their feed and it's the same yeah. thing. I think that's incredibly boring. I, I mean, I hate to say it because a lot of it's time, a lot of times it's like scripture graphics or it's this, you know, tips or whatever. And that's, that's cool, but I don't follow your church to see that necessarily. I, I usually follow on Instagram because I want to see people. I want to see what's going yeah. on. Yeah. And, and some of that in there is good, but my brand for Instagram is that we reveal what's going on here. If that's a scripture graphic or if that's a person, you know, that's what we're going to do. It's a little bit more of an abstract branding than a, than a, you know, hard and fast. We're Chick-fil-A or we're Starbucks or, you know, something like that. We're, that's not what church I love is that I think when when you think about a church that you like to follow, it's not because man their graphics are awesome. <laughs> you know that's like the way church used to be. It's not like that anymore. You know people. Yeah, don't I think, really I think as that. people become more sophisticated in producing content, they realize that yeah. look, this is again, it's the social part, it's the interesting part, right? If I just yeah, if we met for coffee every single week and I said the same exact thing or I said it in the same exact way or I ended every sentence with some tagline, you'd get bored, right? Yep. Um, or, or if everybody that I knew was your friend and my friend came and said the same thing you said every single time yes. and shared the same graphic every single, Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> like I'm all for like the, I had to follow, unfollow a lot of friends, uh, when I was, when I was working at a couple of different churches because they would all share the same graphic and my feed was just, there it is, there yep. it is, there same it is, way. there it is. Like, come on, I don't follow you for that. You know, that's, I don't want that. No, so I, I love the stories aspect. I think that helps with that a little yeah. bit. I mean, one of the things that we advocate is that, hey, think of social content as a seven-layer dip. You do need to have some foundational, you know, scripture graphics or things like that. But yep. Yep. there's all this other stuff, including all this reveal content like you're talking about, that yeah. really brings it to life, right? And you want mm -hmm. to serve that relationship that you're trying to share. So um, yeah. love that perspective for Instagram. Uh, what's the next next platform that you have on deck? Well, the third one, I'm not quite sure where we're going with it yet. It is Twitter. Um, as a church, some churches really get a lot out of Twitter and some don't. It, it depends on your group of people. And my group of people tend to be um, a, a little bit older. Uh, they're upwardly mobile. So I know that there's a lot of professionals and they're on it. 
but I don't know that I don't really know what to do with it yet. So right now what I'm using it for, our word is networking. Nice. So our, our word for Twitter, cause that's what it's naturally good for is finding new people. Yes. Maybe, maybe connecting them to our church through the content I'm sharing there through hashtags or whatever. Um, connecting with other churches, other church pastors, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a customer service thing. People can always contact cause they can do that through Facebook too. But, um, that tends to be more of our family is on Facebook and Twitter is like the public. Anybody can join. And, and so it's kind of like that first rung almost. So we're networking with people that might go, all right, they put out some interesting stuff. I'll give them a shot. I'll follow them. You know, like, but, but Twitter is, is weird. Like even the other night I just tweeted out some nonsense stuff and <laughs> yes, got like 40 something, 40 something followers in 30 minutes, you know, that didn't have any clue who I was or anything. And it just, so you kind of have to take like how many of your followers are really followers and how many of them are just marketing specialists, you know, that are out there. Cause it seems like everybody is on Twitter. So for Twitter, what we we're, I'm trying to figure out what to do. We're, we're at a place where I'm, I'm, I'm just posting to Twitter what works from Facebook or Instagram, uh, or not from there, but the same stuff and not really engaging a lot. I'm trying to, I think we're going to have to make some lists because for me, it's finding out like, who are our people? I'm brand new to the church. Like who are our people? I need to put them in a list. So I've started a list of people who have retweeted us. And that's like my first list, like the re the retweet army is what I call it. So it's the retweet army and just trying to figure out who is like engaging with our stuff. They think it's good enough to share it. Maybe there can come something of that. I'm not sure what's next. So that strategy is still in development, but I know that networking is what Twitter is good at. It's what it's good for. And that there's probably some ways to, to use it in that way. I just haven't figured out what that is yet. So, I mean, we're big, we're small churches. We don't all have it figured out. I mean, it's, it's a work in progress. What about Snapchat? You've got a lot of youth, uh, in the area. I leave that to the youth ministry. I am not, um, I am not a big fan. I don't get it. You know, I just, I, I see its value in some areas, but if Instagram continues to copy it, I kind of wonder, well, I've already got this big audience on Instagram. Why would I try to start over with, with Snapchat? Cause now I'm going uphill starting a, and building a community as well as having to put out more content and it's different. So you can't just put out what you put on other platforms on Snapchat because it's very much more in the moment. And you know, I'm like, I'm busy. I don't have time to monitor that, you know? (laughs) And so it requires so much of me. Now I think youth ministries and college ministries can make a great use of Snapchat. But I think if you're going to use those, I think there needs to be again, a, 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 a vision for it. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? And again, I don't know enough about that platform to really give an example of what that might be, but I can guarantee you go talk to a youth pastor. They're going to go, yeah, here's what we do on it. And they're going to know it. Uh, Cause again, youth pastors have to be on the front end of that frontier to stay up with their kids. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of Snapchat. I think it has a huge future. Um, yeah. despite Instagram, uh, I don't, I, what I really respect and what I like seeing in your example is that you don't have the pressure on yourself to feel like um, I need to be everywhere and you're being very strategic and choosing just a yeah. couple of uh, platforms and making sure you do it well. So I love that that approach that you have. Yeah, thanks. The only other one we have is Pinterest and I use that as a source. Right now it's just source material. I, I, I have other ladies in the church that can pin things and I've made some boards and said, hey, go pin stuff. And if I would go in there and I don't like it, I'll just delete it. You know, I'll probably not say anything to them. But uh, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use it as like a place to grab parenting hacks and blogs and content like that that our church can make use of so that when I do need something to post, I've got a place I can go and just kind of sift through. Oh, that'd be a good one to post. Let me grab that. And I'll go post it because it's super easy to find yeah. infographics and, and blogs and all kinds of great stuff on Pinterest. And, and I'm probably one of the few guys that just loves it. I really love Pinterest, but, uh, I, I've seen it as a great place for content. So I use it as like a source material. It's kind of the idea. We don't publish it really. I published it once, you know, and promoted it once and we've got a couple of followers. It's not really a big deal yet. So, um, I, honestly, I'm trying to figure that one out too, but for, for right now, it's been very helpful in that sense. Love it. Yeah. I, I definitely loved your approach and I think it keeps, 
um, a framework in place for each of those platforms. And that intentionality that you have is just fantastic. I hope that this is something that our listeners here listening into our conversation today, it's inspiring them to really reconsider how they use each of those networks. It's not binary. It's not all social media or none. Each one's very different right. in intent and outcome. And so, um, yeah, thanks for sharing that today. Oh, my pleasure. So my pleasure. if people wanted to get in touch with you today, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Whether it be email, social, website, give, a, give out your digits. Yeah, <laughs> the social media aspect is the best way. I, I have a website, sethmuse.com. All my social is there. Um, my front door for me personally is Twitter. Uh, I like Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot. And I'm not a crazy user, but I use it a lot to engage and network because that's kind of personal for me too in my own company, my own business. So um, that's a good one. Instagram, I just made Instagram public. So gotcha. you can now find me on Instagram. So what's your uh, uh, Twitter handle? Twitter handle is the Seth Muse. Gotcha. And then on Facebook, do you have a personal page that you connect with people to or is that something you keep private? I, I usually keep my personal page private, but I have the Seminary of Hard Knocks, which is my podcast that has its own Facebook page that people can go to and, and link to that and, and like that. So I put out content there as well. It's, it's more than just a podcast. I put out articles and blogs. And yeah, I love that resource. And as we head out for this episode, for this Today's Lunch and Learn, uh, share, just uh, give a little elevator speech on Seminary of Hard Knocks because I love that resource and what you're bringing to the table for communicators out here. Well, I appreciate that. Um, the, the Seminary of Hard Knocks podcast exists to help pastors and leaders, ministry leaders make better decisions with more confidence and clarity. And it is primarily focused on the practical side of ministry because of what you don't learn in seminary. Yeah. Uh, I know there's other resources like Unseminary. I think what you're doing is a great resource uh, at Church Butler that's coming out and all the other stuff you've got going on. Um, but there, there is a practical side of ministry you don't learn by learning to teach the Bible. For sure, Past, for sure. Pastors jump into their jobs and they know how to teach. They know how to preach, but they have to lead meetings. They have to do budgets. They have to do all kinds of practical leadership stuff that they weren't prepared for necessarily in, in college and seminary. And so my podcast focuses on a lot of those things and tries to help these leaders to at least talk about some of these issues and get some ideas to, um, to go forward because I had to learn those the hard way. I was thrown in and I got the bumps and scars to prove it. So that's what the Seminary of Hard Knocks is about. And it's one of my favorite things that I get to do is just to meet new people and, and, and talk about some of these things that, and finding out that I'm not alone and I yes, wasn't alone exactly. is really great. And it's starting to develop a little bit of a community about, about it. So I'm excited about that. Awesome. So uh, be sure to check it out. Seminary of Hard Knocks uh, podcast with Seth Muse. Thank you so much. This wraps up today's Lunch and Learn episode. Um, really appreciate your time and sharing your wisdom with us here today, Seth. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Kenny. And uh, if you really like this episode, we're curious, please drop a comment and let us know what you thought about today's episode in particular, because we're kind of, we're trying to mix it up a little bit with this format um, of this lunch and learn. And um, tell us if you have any other people that you'd love to hear from and learn from. Be sure to connect with Seth directly on Twitter as we continue on learning more and more about church communications.